Hello and welcome to A Book or Two to Review, episode 15. And I'm your host, Dr. Alex Clark. And today I'm recording this on the 29th of July. And I mean, it's on your go, but Alex, you're supposed to be away and you're in your office. All I will say is life happens. I am away though next week. And there will be recordings coming from that. And today's book is a medieval one. And it's Daughters of Edward I. Written by the excellent, judging by this book, although I haven't actually had the joy to meet her, but I would like to, Catherine Warner. And it's a really, really cool history book. And it is really amazing. But before I get into the full discussion today, I want to do, read out part of one of the chapters. And because I want to do that, and because I can imagine it's going to get possibly some pushback, from some people who are going to go, but that's not the pro that that's not what we believe. Well, this is the historically accurate book and done by a very good historian. But still, if one's going to go into battle, one should be properly prepared. <clears throat> now, so this is from chapter sixteen of this book. Joan of Ecre and Gilbert the Red de Clare, Earl of Gloucester and Hertford, were due to marry on the 30th of April, 1290. On the 17th of April, a number of important men travelled to Amesbury Priory in Wiltshire and witnessed Earl Gilbert seal a fascinating and important di document. Eleanor of Provenance is not specifically mentioned as being present, but presumably she was there given that she lived at Amesbury Priory and she might well have played a more important role in conceiving and dictating the document than appears from the extant record. The important men present who witnessed this document, which was written in French, the Dowager Queen of England, being female, did not count as a witness, were the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishops of Bath and Wells, Winchester, Durham, Exeter and Worcester. Henry III's half-brother, William de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, Edward I's brother, Edmund of Lancaster, Earl of Lancaster and Leicester, Henry de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln, and Sir Otto Grandison, Sir William Baracruz, Sir, uh, Sir John St. John, Master William Lew and John de Berwick. Referring to his future wife as Dame Johan, Lady Joan, Gilbert de Clare began as, Our Lord the King, by his grace, has consented to give me Lady Joan, his daughter, to wife. I, to prevent all doubts and suspicion, have sworn on the saints that if Edward I died and he himself was still alive, he would swear fealty to Edward's son, Edward, who on the 17th of April 1290 was not quite six years old, and as his rightful liege lord, and would guard the rights of the realm. If Edward of Carnarvon died without male heirs, but Edward I had other sons of his body, or if Edward of Carnarvon died but left male heirs of his body, Gilbert would swear allegiance to whoever of the king's male heirs was his rightful liege lord. The most fascinating part came next. If Edward I and all his sons were dead, and none of them had male heirs born of their bodies, the Earl of Gloucester promised that he would swear fealty to Lady Eleanor, Dame Eleanor, Edward I's eldest daughter, as his liege lady, and subsequently to heirs born of her body. The document stated, And if by misfortune it should happen that God makes his commandment to our Lord the King and to his sons, and they have no heirs of their bodies, if the Lady Eleanor, eldest daughter of the, my Lord the King above mentioned, is alive, I will bear good faith to this same Eleanor and to the begotten heirs of her body, and in no manner, not by force, nor by deceit, disturb her rights, nor her, nor the heirs of her body, should she have them, nor the kingdom of England, nor the land of Ireland, according to the ordinance of the, our Lord, the King above mentioned, which ordinance is, that our Lord, the King, which is an ordained, that should Lord Edward of Carnarvon, his son, or another son, should he have one, remain without heirs of his body, that therefore, after the death of our Lord, the King above mentioned, the King of England, and the land of Ireland, should remain to Lady Elna, his eldest daughter, and the begotten of her body. Edward I thus acknowledged the possibility that one day his daughter might inherit his kingdom in her own right. It's very interesting to note that the king preferred the idea of his throne passing to his daughters rather than to his younger brother Edmund, Earl of Leicester, Lancaster and Leicester, and subsequently to Edmund's sons Thomas and Henry of Lancaster, who in April 1290 were about 12 and 9 years old respectively. If Eleanor died without heirs, then the kingdom of England would belong to her sister, Joan of Ecre and her heirs, then to the next sister, i.e. Margaret, though she was not named, and so from daughter to daughter and heir to heir. 
This was a startling decision by Edward I, given that the only precedent for a queen regent in England was the disastrous example of Empress Maud, or Matilda, a century and a half previously. Maud was the only surviving legitimate child of Henry I, William the Conqueror's youngest son, and her father forced his barons to swear fealty to her as the next ruler. On Henry's death in 1135, however, Maud's cousin, Stephen of Bois, son of William the Conqueror's daughter, Adele, took advantage of Maud's absence in France and had himself crowned king instead. Maud and Stephen battled over the throne for the next few years during a period of English history no now known as the Anarchy, and Maud came close to being crowned queen at one point, but managed to alienate the Londoners to the extent that they chased her out of the city before her coronation. Edward I, Empress Maud's great-grandson, must have been familiar with the history, yet did not let this rather unfortunate precedent dissuade him from the decision to make his daughters heirs of the throne, failing his and Edward of Carnarvon's male issue. In England, in the late 13th century, the system of primogenitor, whereby the other son inherited everything, did not apply to female heirs, who in the house of male heirs took precedence over their sisters wherever they came in the birth order were entitled to equal portions of any inheritance. It is very interesting to note that Edward I did not intend this system to apply to his kingdom, but wished his eldest daughter, or failing her, his second eldest daughter, and so on, to inherit England in its entirety. He did not wish his kingdom to be divided into four equal parts for his four secular daughters, Eleanor, Joan, Margaret, and Elizabeth, as would have happened had Edward been merely a landowner in England and not its kingdom and king. In April 1290, Eleanor was still betrothed to the King of Aragon, and Edward must also realise that his daughter's Spanish children, assuming she had any, would have a strong claim to the Kingdom of England, yet this did not dissuade him either. End of the first decision that suggests that he found much to admire in his daughter's personalities and abilities, and thought that Eleanor and her younger sisters would be able to cope with the challenges of ruling his kingdom. Ultimately, however, this situation never came about, as Edward of Carnarvon was a healthy, strong child who survived his father, though Eleanor of Windsor herself did not. In 1300 and 1301, Edward I fathered two more sons with his second wife, Marguerite of France, who entered the line of succession behind their much older half-brother. The elder of these two boys was heir to the English throne between 1307 and 1312. Edward of Carnarvon himself, as Edward II, fathered two legitimate sons in 1312 and 1316 from his marriage to Isabella of France, and his elder son succeeded him as Edward III in 1327 and fathered seven legitimate sons, of whom five survived infancy. The question of rightful succession to the English throne arose again in 1376, when Edward III's eldest son, Edward of Woodstock, Prince of Wales, died in his father's lifetime. The prince left a nine-year-old son, Richard of Bordeaux, as his only surviving legitimate child, and the boy, Julie, succeeded his grandfather as King Richard II. In 1377, Edward III's second su eldest surviving son, Lionel Antwerp, had died in 1368, also leaving only one child, a daughter called Philippa of Clarence, Countess of March and Ulster. Philippa's Mortimer children, born in the 1370s, came to have an excellent claim to the throne in the 1390s because Richard II had no offspring. In 1399, however, Henry IV, son of Edward III's eldest, uh, third eldest surviving son, John of Gaunt, became King of England after he forced the abdication of Richard II, and Henry thus set aside his cousin, of Philip, uh, cousin Philippa of Clarence's descendants. This had perhaps been in line with Edward III's own wishes. The king dictated a document after the death of the Prince of Wales in 1376, stating that he wished his eldest son's, eldest son's son, Richard, to succeed him, and subsequently, failing any issue of Richard, this, uh, his third son, John of Gaunt, and his male issue, his fourth son, Edmund Langley, and his male issue, and his fifth and youngest son, Thomas of Woodstock, and his male issue. Edward did not mention his granddaughter, Philippa, the only child of his dead son, Lionel, or her children as possible successors. Given that Edward III but himself began to claim the throne of France via his mother Isabella in 1337, and thus obviously believed that the succession of a kingdom could be inherited from a woman, his decision to exclude his, uh, his granddaughter and her children from the succession to his own English throne is rather startling, and stands in contrast to his grandfather Edward I's decision in 1290 to leave his kingdom to one of his daughters, failing his and his only living son's male issue. Now, I love this book. It's called Edward's Daughters of Edward I, and it's wonderful. It is full of pictures, it is full of documents, it's full of surprising things, but, and I'm going to say this very simply, I'm a naval historian by training and by profession, and by emphasis. But Edward I 
and passed on a lot to his grandson, Edward III. They're a lot alike. And Edward III does make use of the female line to claim the French throne. And it is certainly not beyond people to be uh, duplicitous or two-faced. But I think that might be a slightly more obvious answer. When Edward I dies, no one wants to knock around with those documents because they don't need to. There is Edward II. There is a very clear line of succession. After Edward III, it starts to get a little bit more iffy. A lot more iffy, in fact. And whilst it's not impossible that Edward III was both simultaneously using uh, the female line to claim the French throne and at the same time disinheriting the female line on his own throne, there is also a very mm, good likelihood that it might have been an adaptation post a uh, new king to shore up the new king's claim to the throne. Let's be honest, it's not beyond the wit of anyone to think, hmm, I could alter this. I could play around with this. And it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Now, this is a 40 chapter book. It's published in 2021. It's brand new. And it is hundreds of pages long. 232, really. It's got wonderful endnotes in it. Even endnotes for the appendices, which I just love. I love that. I love those endnotes in the appendices. The academic in me who has the mark essays is just going, woohoo! References! It's gorgeous referencing. It's gorgeous endnotes. They're fully detailed. It's got a wonderful bibliography, list of secondary sources as well as primary sources, and it's also got this beautiful appendix which has children of the first daughters in it, and where they turn up, and biographical details of Edward's the first daughters. Now, what another thing, you know, you, you have a list of his, all his children, probably, but you have the fact Eleanor is born at Windsor Castle on the 17th or 18th of June, 1269, betrothed to Alfonso III, King of Aragon. But married Henry III, Count of Bar. In Bristol, uh, in September 19, 1293. And died in August 1298. So he was only married for five years. And if you think about it. Only lived for 29 years. Joan of Acre. Um... Eleanor's possibly buried in Westminster Abbey. Joan is buried in Clare Priory. Uh, born in the Holy Land in the spring of 1272, Joan is. Um, married Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Gloucester and Hertfordshire. Uh, in 1290. Was widowed in 1295. Then married Ralph de Mortimer. 
in 1297 and died in 1307. So, well, she got to 35. Margaret, born 15th of March, 1275, um, almost certainly at Windsor Castle, apparently. Married John of, Bra of Brabant in September 1275, later Duke John II of Brabant in, on, in, no, he was born in 1275, she, uh, they married in 1290, widowed in 1312, Still alive in 1333. Date of death unknown. Buried in Church of St. Godall in Brussels with her husband. Godall. So, she possibly lived quite a while. Let's be honest. Getting to... 58 is a fairly good age for this period. Uh, another younger sister, Mary, born at the Palace of Woodstock near Oxford on the 11th or 12th of March 1229, entered Amesbury Priory, Wiltshire on 15th August 1285, later veiled as a nun, and died in 1332. Elizabeth, again, born 1782 in Rutland, North Wales, married Firstly, Jeanne the Count of Holland in Ipswich uh, in 1297, widowed 1299, then married Humphrey de Bohon, Earl of Hereford and Essex, in 1302, and died in 1316. So, when she died, she was 34. And Edward I's youngest child was Elna, born to Marguerite of France on the 6th of May 1306, betrothed on the 8th of May 1306 to Robert, heir to the French counties of Burgundy and Artois, but died in August 1311, buried in Beaulieu Abbey, Hampshire. There's actually even a chapter in here entitled Three Weddings and a Death. I love an awful sense of humor. This is a wonderful book. And it's wonderful because it again makes you start to think in formal power versus formal power. Women couldn't be witnesses, so they wouldn't sign documents. So, how do we know if they're in the room or not? You can either presume they weren't, because you cannot prove it, or you can look at the context and the syntax of the document and think, hmm. And let's be honest, women at this time were often better educated than their, their male counterparts. They would often read more, they'd often be far more linguistically astute than the majority of the male. Yes, priests, etc., tend to be men of the cl uh, men of the clergy tend to be higher and more highly educated than your average feudal lord, who tends to have had to focus quite a significant time of their schooling time on the ability to beat the living daylights out of their other uh, other people. But whilst wearing their equivalent body, a weight in body armour. All these things are true. <clears throat> so it makes sense that perhaps some very powerful men could be in the room and just weren't mentioned. And that's when it comes down to an interesting discussion as a historian, because as a historian, you learn the power of words. You learn the power of word selection.
you learn the power of phraseology. The power to influence. I talk a lot about the Terence, and this is where part of my interest in this period comes from. I talk about Terence and international relations and those sort of things. And we're often talking about soft power. The interesting thing is when people think soft power is something new. Soft power has been around as long as humans have been. Yes. I have a mighty helmet, but to make it fit comfortably on my head and do its job, I use a hat. Soft power, hard power. Together, it's smart power, or maybe just power. So, if you're honestly going to sit there in a historical discussion and try and say, that people had no power or influence just because you don't see it written down, well, then I'm going to start talking to you about the wars and battles which were never fought. Because we can all talk about the battles which were fought. We can all talk about the aircraft which come back with holes on them. We can't talk about the aircraft which come back without holes on them, because those of the aircraft have probably crashed. That's called a confirmation, and that's that famous diagram, which originates the whole, uh, some of the ideas of confirmation bias. Well, it's the same with wars which weren't fought. Because they weren't fought, we don't know about them. How many people record successful deterrence events. How many people record how many times just because a ship turned up or a, the correct party was hosted and the correct words were put in the correct ears that something didn't happen. People don't record those things. They're not exciting. If you consider we don't do it today, in fact, today, such things are often looked as frivolous. You always get whichever, so it doesn't matter which side of the political party that's in power, which side of the spectrum they come from, on which side of the spectrum the political party which isn't in power comes from. <clears throat> Any time one party does something which is a big diplomatic soft power thing or an event or something like that, the other side will say it's a waste of money. Well, in historical terms, it just doesn't get written about, and you don't hear about it. So you don't hear about soft power. So, this question. It's all about soft power in politics. This book is all about. And I would say the question it, the line of succession, succession, well, my answer would be, I'm sure you've looked at those documents thoroughly. But the trouble is with telling forgeries from that period apart and the real thing is they might just have rewritten it entirely and used and just written a whole new thing. And it would still be pretty much as old, so we couldn't really tell the difference. Or just got rid of the appropriate documents. Might be in another document somewhere. Might have been in another document that mysteriously disappeared. It can happen. But still, soft power. Because the other thing I'd like to point out is when you're dealing with daughters of Edward I and you're dealing with Queen uh, Empress Maud or Matilda, as I prefer to call her, as I was brought up calling her, and you're dealing with all that history, it might seem unprecedented 
but it isn't. And the fact is, there have been lots of queen regents in history, of queens who have basically acted as the ruler of the country, as the top person, while the king's away. In fact, often that is the reason why a king wants a good wife to be queen. Because if they're going off fighting a war, they need someone they can trust back running the home. They need the cap to make the helmet work. So I don't think there was as much of a fear as is sometimes pushed out, and I'm, I'm sure there are extreme ones, but you make lots of noise. But the trouble is also remember our times. It tends to be the most extreme views who make the loudest noises. We don't agree with them, but they make the loudest noises. And the trouble is, if you're looking back through history, the loudest noises can uh, can pick up be picked up far more easily. But I don't think there was as much fear of females, the female rule of women, being the monarch and ruling as some suggest. I certainly don't think you'd have had the relative stability you had at various times under female leadership if you had had that fear. And I don't think that the scenario under after Henry VIII, where you have First Mary properly first Mary, and then Elizabeth. Yeah, they make speeches. Yes, let's be honest, Mary was not that popular at the end, because she did, did go pretty off the rails. And Mary, Queen of Scots, again, had issues. But the thing is, we're talking about time period. Yes, you can go, well, you know, they're more enlightened by the Renaissance and this sort of era. And you're going, really? They're that much more enlightened? And honestly, who are you talking about are more enlightened? Because education hasn't got that widespread. Yes, people tend to be able more. There are more, more people who can read and write, but that isn't a. It's got. It's gone from a very, very small, fra a very small, minuscule fraction of the population to a incredibly small fraction of the population. It's not exactly a massive improvement here. Uh, so, if widespread attitudes had been that bad, you'd have thought you'd have faced. They would have faced the peasants' result revolt or something. Because surely there would have been at least one or two, <clears throat> let's call them gentlemen, for one to, uh, for, because YouTube wouldn't like me to use the actual phrase I'd use for them, who would be willing to take, a, uh, take advantage of such attitudes to try and secure the throne from themselves. There's always going to be one or two. There weren't. And yes, that is centuries later, but I don't think it moves as fast as we necessarily think it does. That's my two penny left in it. It's a very, very good book. Link is down below. If you're interested in this, if you're interested in understanding what's going on in court, what's going on around the times, and a lot of the context of the history we hear about, this is a great book to read. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And as always, please like if you like. Please subscribe if you'd like to hear more. Consider joining the channel if you'd like to have some super emoji fun. And consider uh, anyone who feels like supporting me. Patron is 
wonderful and thank you for all the support. It really helps with research. Take care.